Good morning. morning. Happy Father's Day. For our call to worship this morning, I'd like to read from Psalms 150. It says this, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We would like to welcome you to the Abernet Christian Church this morning. Um, some announcements that we'd like to highlight. Um, I will be leaving after church this afternoon to go to camp. So I'll be gone until Friday, and I'll be back on Friday. So um, if you need to get a hold of me, um, call my cell phone number and leave a message. And the reception is not very good there. So I that's probably a good thing because it's probably not good to have campers with <clears throat> cell phones all the time. But um, there's like one place that I can go and get reception. So um, if go ahead and leave a message, and I'll eventually we'll get it. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. The annual meeting and carry in dinner is next Sunday. The community <coughs> vacation Bible school will be from 9 to 3 on the 27th of July here at the church. Um, we'd like to wish Jeannie a happy birthday. Her celebration was yesterday, and she had a great turnout. Um, she's related to a lot of people. <laughs> but that's a good thing so for those who are dads there's cookies to pick up on your way out so we want you to make sure that you do that and so we still have several people that are on our prayer list do we have any update on todd and his surgery at all do you know he came he came home out of icu and went to ninth floor and the next day they sent him home He's okay. had a lot go on, but he's home. So. Okay, so that's good. But he's got more to do. Though. He's yeah, he's he's still got a long ways to go. Okay. And then too, I had a, a phone call on Saturday, Friday. Um, my brother is going in tomorrow, and they thought he had a heart attack. He was out mowing in the yard, and they don't think so, but he has issues anyway. So he's just sixty, so he's not very old. So I'll know more tomorrow. Okay, and then. Any update on Mike's mom? Uh, surgery went well. Oh, she's home. I took her down and uh, on Wednesday, and they replaced her pacemaker, and she's back home. Now she's just dealing with the pain from falling and hurting her shoulder, but um, she's doing okay. Awesome. And then um, Melanie asked that I would um, add the family of Rita Harmon. So when Melanie was growing up in Prairie Hill, Prairie Hill was a very small church and they couldn't afford her dad full time. So he worked for, as a farmhand for one of the elders in the church. That was Kent and Rita Harmon. Rita was killed in a car accident this last week. She was 77 years old. And so we just asked to kind of keep the family of Rita in your prayers as well. Um, it was a pretty big shock for Melanie to find out. So, um, well, are there any others that we want to mention at this time? Yes. I have a friend, Steve. He's been diagnosed with probably stage three cancer. And it just started out with kind of a lump on the side of his face. And then it kind of went to his lymph nodes. And then he had a lump in his mouth. No, no pain at all. And went in and it was cancer. So we need prayers for him. Sure. Any others? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our great and our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne today, we just thank you for the beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you that we have the privilege to be able to meet and to worship in your house. And as we do so, we just lift up your name and just um, give you the praise and the honor and the worship that you so very, very much deserve. As we come before your throne, we lift up to you those that are on our prayer list. <laughs> Heavenly Father, those who need your very real and very special touch. We're grateful that Mike's mom came through her pacemaker replacement and without any problems or difficulties. And again, we just thank you for that. We thank you that um, Todd um, did came through surgery okay. And we just pray that you would continue to be with him as he receives the additional treatments that he needs. 
We ask, Lord, that you would just be with Sherry's brother as um, they try to treat him for a heart attack, that if it be your will, that you just reach down and touch him and help to bring healing to him and help to make him whole and well. We ask, Lord, that you be with Steve as he has been diagnosed with cancer and that, Heavenly Father, you bring healing to him, whether that comes through your hand or through the hands of the doctors, that, Lord, they would be able to treat that and, and that he would be able to have a long and a healthy life. We ask that you be with uh, Rita's family as, as they struggle and deal with the, the loss of, of a mother and a wife and, and uh, just a, a wonderful lady. And we know that she's in your presence, but Lord, it's still hard for the rest of us who are left behind, and so we pray for them. We pray, Lord, also for our friend Norris, who um, had a stroke this last week and has been had his eyesight affected. And Lord, we just pray for him also and that you just bring healing to him as well. All these things we ask, we pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 555. And let's stand and we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. 555. Five, five. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pathway clouds will overspread the sky but when traveling days are over not a shadow not a sigh when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all For our second hymn this morning, we'll do hymn number 596, first, second, and fourth verse, 596. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. conflict whether great or small do not be discouraged god is over all 
Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. And then, <coughs> if you'll turn over to hymn number 224, We'll sing first, second, and final verse of Ivory Palaces 224. Our Lord has come and so wondrous fine. Never alone. Scripture reading today will be from 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, 23rd through 26th verse. For I received from you, the Lord, what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. After he instituted the Lord's Supper, Jesus continued to teach the disciples during the evening. He assured them, I will not leave you comfortless. 
I will come to you. Earlier he had said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The Christian is never alone. Like the psalmist, he can say with confidence, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Psalms 23, 4. Coming about the table of remembrance each first day of the week, we are assured that Jesus is here. But he is also with us tomorrow, and the next day, and the next at home, at work, at a party, even in a difficult situation. Wherever we are, we are not alone. A Christian preacher, <clears throat> preacher in Poland told visitors from America, I have been imprisoned three times, once by Hitler, twice by the communists, but Jesus has never left me. Let's be turning to the communion hymn on 175, singing the first, third, and standing on the floor. Father, we are again so thankful to be back into your house and gathered around this communion table here to give you praise. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the ways that you have blessed each one of us. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus, and for the time you allowed him to be on the earth with us and for the life lessons he left. We're especially thankful, dear Lord, that you allowed your son to go to the cross and to carry with him the burden of the sins of the world. We ask that you would bless the emblems of that suffering and death. Bless the loaf representing his broken body and bless the cup representing his shed blood shed that we would have a way for our sins to be forgiven. We'd also, dear Lord, thank you for your great promise that whoever believes should have everlasting life and be able to spend eternity with you. I pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our great and our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of our service, we pause to reflect on the many blessings that you have bestowed on each and every one of us. Lord, you've been so good to us in so many, many different ways. And as we reflect on those blessings, we give back a portion of that that you have so freely given. As we do so, we ask for your continued blessing on both the gift and the giver. And that, Lord, you would help us to use those gifts to reach out to our world and our community with the love of Jesus to all who will listen. I ask now that you be with the remainder of our service. I ask that you be with me as I bring the message, that it be one that's easy to understand and easy to apply. All these things we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Sorry about earlier there. Every once in a while, I just get what I refer to as sneezers because I just don't have one or two. They just keep going and going and going, and my wife's like, go blow your nose. <laughs> so I, I just don't know what it is, that, um, if I'm allergic to something or I, I have no idea. I've never been able to figure out rhyme nor reason to it, but I know it's annoying for you guys, so I'm sorry. Uh, this morning, I'd like to look at five Father's Day gifts for your children. Five Father's Day gifts for your children. And so if you would, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. I'd like to read verses 1 through 4. It says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but instead bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Dads, you have an important job. Your job is to bring up your children so that they know and that they love Jesus. In the Bible, over and over again, um, the Bible refers to God as our Heavenly Father. For some people, because they had a good father, it's easy to draw that connection. But for some, whose father was not so good, it makes that a very hard connection to understand or to make sense. If you grew up with a father that was not a good father, then when the Bible talks about God as our heavenly father, it would be easy to say, well, why would I want that? My dad was horrible, right? And so, you know, we have a tremendous responsibility as dads 
to raise our children up to know God and to love Him. And, you know, to be able to function in the world that's around us. One of the hardest things to do, I think, is for us to accept constructive criticism. It's always hard when somebody um, thinks that you aren't doing the very best that you could possibly do. But a, a sign of a very mature person is a person who's able to understand and recognize that they're not perfect. I mean, the only perfect people that we have here in our church is maybe Charlie and Mike, I don't know. But, <laughs> but you know, um, none of us are perfect. And it's, but it's hard for us many times to accept constructive criticism. That's a sign of maturity for people that can do that and to realize that I can be better. Another area that I think, you know, that's really important for dads to instill into their kids is the, the ability to respect authority. And I think that's something that we see young people struggling with a lot in our society today. This ability to respect authority. You know, if you can't respect your mom and dad, then if you can't respect your, your earthly father, how are you going to be able to respect and to honor your heavenly father? If we can't respect authority, if we don't learn to acknowledge and to realize that there's always going to be somebody who we have to answer to, as young people, then they're going to struggle for the rest of their life because there's always going to be people that they have to answer to. I don't care who you are. There's always going to be somebody that you have to answer to, whether it be a police officer, a judge, you know, even, even President Biden has to answer to those people that are around him in his cabinet. You know, there are things that he can do and things that he can't do with executive orders and things like that. Even, even though he is, you know, perhaps one of the most uh, powerful men in the entire world, he can't do exactly everything that he wants to do. He still has to answer to the courts and to the legislature. And so the sooner that we understand that, that there will always be people that we have to, you know, um, honor and respect, the easier that it will be for our children. You know, I got a lot of spankings growing up. And I grew up as a preacher's kid. So... My whole life, I've never actually had the opportunity to sit in a pew and actually worship with my whole family. That's never been available to me. Like, you know, growing up, it was mom who corralled us kids. And there was a short pew in the back where she could get her hands on us real fast if we got out of line. Um, growing up, it was Melanie that had to corral the kids because I've always been up here. Um, when Melanie was little, she got to worship with a, with a family, with her dad. Um, and the stories that are told is that when um, they got out of line, uh, Grandpa, well, Grandpa Smith, her dad, uh, would flick their ear to get their attention. Um, I'm sure it never happened to Melanie. It only happened to her brother, Mike, I'm sure. But... Um, you know, I mean, that's just something that, that being involved in a family that has done ministry like my entire life, this is something that I've never actually been able to be a part of. And, and maybe someday when I get to, if I get to retire, I'll be able to sit with my wife and we'll be able to worship together. Um, just something that, that we've had to sacrifice in order to do what I do. 
But uh, there's five gifts that I'd like to look at this morning that we can give to our children. The first gift is the gift of time. The gift of time. And um, in order to illustrate this, I want to first use kind of a negative example. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2, I'd like to read verses 22 through 25. So Eli, let me set this up a little bit. Eli was the high priest in Israel. So if you remember your Bible history, um, Joseph gets uh, sent into captivity. He sends his, his brothers, sell him as a slave into Egypt. And through a series of circumstances that God uses uh, Joseph, Joseph ultimately ends up becoming second in command in all of Egypt. And then there's this great famine. And so Joseph's family comes to Egypt to find food because God had used Joseph to prepare for this famine that was coming. And the Bible says that after Joseph died, another Pharaoh rose that didn't know Joseph, and he enslaved Joseph's family. And for the next 400 years, they're slaves in Egypt until a guy by the name of Moses comes along and leads them out of Egypt toward the promised land. They stop off at Mount Sinai. God gives them directions on how to build the tabernacle. And he establishes the priesthood. And uh, because of their lack of faith, they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because they refuse to trust God. Finally, as they come in, um, Joshua leads the Hebrew people, the Israelite people, and they uh, conquest Canaan, and they receive their inheritance. And for a while, the tabernacle remains at Shiloh. Eli is the high priest, and he is over, runs the worship that happens there at Shiloh. Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And as we're about to find out, they didn't turn out very well. It says this, now Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. Eli said to them, I have been hearing reports from the people about the wicked things that you are doing. Why do you keep sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If someone sins against another person, God can mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who is there that can intercede? But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father, for the Lord was already planning to put them to death. Now, Eli was a good high priest, but Eli was a bad father. And I think probably what happened was Eli spent so much time being a high priest that he didn't spend enough time raising his sons. And we see what the result is. And ultimately, uh, where it says there that the Lord is already planning to put them to death, that comes to pass uh, when the Philistines go into battle against the Israelite people. They go into battle, and they are defeated by the Philistines. And so Hophni and Phinehas, they come back to Shiloh, and they are determined that they're going to make God do what they want him to do. And so they go into the Holy of Holies and they take the Ark of the Covenant out of the Holy of Holies and they use it to lead the Israelites back into battle, even though Eli pleads with them not to do it. At this point, Eli is a very old man and his vision is bad. He's gone blind. Um, today, maybe we would find out that he was diabetic, you know, or something we don't know, but, but the Bible says that he was very heavy and that he had gone blind 
and his sons won't listen to them. They carry the ark into battle because they think it's this good luck charm, this, this magical talisman. And they're defeated by the Philistines. Hophni and Phinehas are killed. And the ark that represented the presence of God is taken by the Philistines and put in the temple of Dagon, a false god that they worshipped. Eli is sitting, and, and I can just imagine, you know, the stress that he is feeling and everything that's going on as he waits for word to come back from the battle. There were no satellite dishes, no CNN or anything like that in that day, and so they had to wait for a runner, someone who had been at the battle, to run back and tell them what the news was. When the runner came back, he said that the battle had been lost, Hophni and Phinehas were killed, and that the ark had been taken by the Philistines. Eli was so overcome by that that the scripture says that he fell backwards in his chair, broke his neck, and he died. It caused, I don't remember which one of the sons, was married, um, caused his wife to go into labor, and she gave birth to a son, and in Bible times, names meant something. Today, a lot of times we'll name people, we'll go through the name books, and we pick a name that we like or think sounds good, or, but in those days, they named kids, they, names had meaning, and so um, as this lady gives birth to her son. Her husband has died. Her, her father-in-law has died. The ark has been taken. Israel has been defeated. And so she names her son Ichabod. How would you like to go through life with that name? Ichabod, because it meant the glory has departed. It meant God's left us. Poor Ichabod had to go through life and and every time somebody saw him, they were reminded that God had left. I think a big part of the problem with Hophni and Phinehas is that Eli didn't spend enough time. He was so busy doing God's work. He was so busy doing important things that his children got neglected. Time is so important. And many, many times our kids define love as time. Having time to do things with them, to invest in them, to share with them. The first gift is time. The second gift is the gift of doing. The gift of doing. Now, I don't have time to, to read the whole story that I want to use for the example of this, but the example that I want to give is the example of Abraham and Isaac. Remember, God had promised that he would make a great nation of Abraham's descendants. That his descendants would be as many as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. There's only one problem. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have kids. It wasn't until Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 that they had their first child. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's impossible, right? I mean, uh, Sarah would have gone through menopause way before that. <clears throat> and in fact... Um, scripture seems to indicate <clears throat> and acknowledge that they were unable to have children. They were too old to have kids. <clears throat> but God performed a miracle that allowed Sarah to conceive. And she gave birth to Isaac at 90 years of age. I mean, I am 56, almost 57. I can't imagine trying to raise kids at my age. Almost double that. 
and, and imagine, you know, I mean, I can't keep up with my kids now. Um, I, I, I just can't imagine it, right? But I think what is extraordinary is a story that we find in the Old Testament about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham loved Isaac. In fact, he loved Isaac so much that God was concerned that he loved Isaac more than him. And so he decided to test Abraham. And so he said to Abraham, I want you to take your son Isaac and I want you to sacrifice him to me on a mountain that I will show you. To Abraham's credit, he took Isaac, he took the wood, he took the fire, and they went to the mountain that God had told him to go to. When they got there, Abraham told the servants to stay with the donkeys or whatever they were, camels or whatever they were on. And he took Isaac alone with him up to the top of the mountain. Can you imagine Abraham's heart, how it must have broken as Isaac is walking alongside him and he says, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where is the sacrifice? Knowing that Isaac was to be that sacrifice. They get to the top of the mountain and they build the altar. They put the wood on top of the altar and then Abraham ties Isaac's hands and feet and lays him on top of the altar. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. How old is Abraham? Boy, he's a lot older than 100 by now. Like, you know, 107, 108, 110, 112. You know, we don't know exactly. But Isaac is old enough to walk up the mountain and carry the wood for the fire, for the sacrifice on his back. So he's that big. Do you honestly think that Abraham could have tied Isaac up if he wouldn't have allowed it? There's no way. There's, you know, again, I'm 56 years old. I am not anywhere near as strong as I used to be. Melanie used to come to me when she wanted the jars opened, right? And th there's been times when Josh, Josh was home and I had to hand the jar to Josh because I just don't have the strength in my hands that I used to have. And I'm not anywhere near 100. We talk about Abraham's faith but you know, Isaac had a tremendous amount of faith to allow himself to be laid up on that altar. And I think it's a tremendous indication of what Abraham had invested in his son, that his son would trust him so completely. I can't imagine what went through Abraham's heart and his mind as he walked up that mountain. But we do have a glimpse of what he was thinking as he was preparing to sacrifice Isaac. The Bible tells us that Abraham takes his knife and he raises it up to sacrifice his son. And God stayed his hand and said, stop, don't do this, for I now know that you love me more than your son. And Abraham turned and saw a ram caught in the in the bushes, in the thicket, and sacrifice the ram instead. The Bible tells us in the New Testament a little bit maybe what was going through Abraham's mind. Because I can't imagine sacrificing any of my children. And although Abraham had never seen it, Abraham believed that if he sacrificed his son, 
that God would raise him from the dead. Because the New Testament tells us so. He had, he had so much faith in God that he believed that if he sacrificed his son that God would bring him back to him. That's how he was able to do what he did. He did so much with Isaac, had to have, that Isaac became like Abraham. He became like his dad. You know, doing things together is much better than just being together. Investing in your kids is so much better than just watching TV together. <laughs> I've always thought that uh, movies are probably not the best first dates. Because you go to the movie, you sit in a dark uh, theater, you both are staring at a screen and you're not talking at all. Right? Um, I always thought that maybe bowling or something would be better. You get to see how well somebody wins and loses. You know, you get to see a lot more of who they are. Um, when Josh was little, it's interesting because he used to say that when he grew up, he was going to be a preacher that drove bus and fought fires. Um, because he wanted to be like his dad. And I think that's why it's so important for us to be the kind of example that our kids need to be. So that kind of brings me to my next point. The third gift that we need to give our kids is the gift of virtues. And the question that I have is, what kind of character do you model? What kind of character do you model? I remember seeing a cartoon, a Christian cartoon, and it shows a young kid coming home, and dad is sitting, coming home from Sunday school, and dad is sitting in his chair watching the TV, and he comes in the door and says, guess what I learned today, hypocrite? You know, that's not a good thing. <laughs> it's not a good thing. Um, we need to lead by our example. The best lessons in life are caught, not taught. If they see something that's important to you, it will be important to them also. If they see that you love your wife and yet you treat her with honor and respect, that's the way that they'll treat their wife. If they don't see that, then they're not going to reflect that. And so it's important that we, you know, be, that we be the kind of people, men, that we want our young men and daughters to be like. It's easier said than done, isn't it? You know, it would be nice if when your first baby was born, that as they handed, you know, mom, the baby wrapped up in claws, that they gave dad, you know, a manual on how to raise your kids. But it doesn't work that way, does it? And I think what's amazing is that... Um, in, for example, in our family, we had four kids born to the same mother and father, raised in the same home, and yet they are so very different. And how I treated Bethany when she's growing up doesn't work with Becca because their personalities are so very different. 
It doesn't mean that mom and dad suddenly changed. Well, maybe a little. You know, uh, I'm old. <laughs> and sometimes this, this just not worth the battle. <laughs> right? But, but more than that, it has to do with the differences in the personality of our kids. And you can't treat them all the same because they're very different. You need to model dads how to be a good father. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 29, it says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it to make it belong to God. Christ used the word to make the church clean by washing it with water. He died so, that it could, so he could give the church to himself like a bride in all her beauty. He died so that the church could be pure and without fault, with no evil or sin or any other wrong in it. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. The man who loves his uh, wife loves himself. No one ever hates his own body, but feeds and takes care of it. And that is what Christ does for the church. The Bible tells us, men, that we're to love our life, our, our, love our life, we're to love our wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. Well, what did he do for the church? He died for it. Because the church isn't a building. The church is the people. The people that are in it. If Christ loved the church so much that he was willing to die for it, and we're to love our lives, our wives, our wives, good grief, in the same way that we love, that Christ loved the church, that means that we are to love our wives so much that we would lay down our lives for them in an instant. If you knew that your husband loved you in that way, would it be hard to respect him? No. The problem is, it's hard for wives to respect their husband when they don't feel like they love them. Wives are told to respect their husbands and husbands are told to love their wives. And it works when they both do what they're supposed to be doing. Fourthly, the gift of sharing. I gotta go quickly because I'm out of time. Um, dads, don't exasperate your children. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is right, the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first of the Ten Commandments that ends with a promise. And this is the promise that if you honor your father and mother, you will live a long life full of blessing. And now a word to you fathers. <clears throat> Don't make your children angry by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and the instruction approved by the Lord. Okay, so we're not to exasperate our children, but we are to discipline them and to instruct them. Is discipline always fun? Nope. No, it is not, but it's necessary. We're to look to uh, discipline and instruct our children, but we're not to exasperate them. And, you know, maybe one of the ways that we can do that is, is to share our dreams with them, what we hope for them. You know, um, no father ever said to his kid, I hope that you become a drunk in the gutter. Right? We want what's best for our kids. We want them to be the very best that they can possibly be. So when they go to school, we want them to get good grades. We want them to apply themselves. We want them to be diligent because we want what's best for them. Do we share what our hopes and our dreams and our aspirations are for our kids? Or do all they ever hear is the negative things about how to be better? 
And then finally, the gift of encouragement. The gift of encouragement. Um, we can see Paul's example of that. Um, and although Timothy was not his son, he talks about the encouragement there. Paul, an apostle of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. <clears throat> so Timothy was not his biological son, but Timothy was this young man that he mentored and, you know, kind of became his spiritual father. Grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and hope to uh, Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went to, into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. In other words, Paul was saying to Timothy, you know, he was encouraging him. He said, You're my, you are my uh, true son in the faith. I might not have borne you physically, but you're every bit my son. And then he encourages him. You know, uh, we need to encourage and get excited about our kids as well. And show them that, that we love them and that we care about them and that they're important to us. Dads, you've got a tremendous responsibility. But we dare not shirk it. Because God has entrusted into us the most important thing in all of the world. That is human souls that are going to spend eternity in one of two places. This morning, if you have a decision that you'd like to make, we invite and encourage you to come as we sing our invitation hymn. Our invitation hymn is hymn number 387. And let's stand and we'll sing the first and the final verse of hymn number 387. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am thou Heavenly Father, as we once more come before your throne, I just pray that, you would, that we would follow your example of the way that you have loved us to be that same kind of example to our children, that they may learn to love you, and that, Heavenly Father, that they would be the kind of children that you would be proud of. I ask that as we leave this place that we would carry Jesus with us to all who will listen. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm.